Hello Bible Geeks, Ryan Schumacher here. I'm here with week eight. This is our second to last week on the series regarding foreknowledge, suffering, and freedom uh, called What Does God Know and When Did He Know It? Or When Does He Know It? Uh, I haven't really introduced that title um, over and over in each one. I should have come up with a nice title slide, but alas, I didn't. Uh, so we're towards the end. We're now looking at the problem of suffering. We spent a lot of time on foreknowledge. We talked a lot about human freedom. And now we're going to be getting into the questions of suffering. Buckle your seatbelts. I'm looking at my slide deck. This is going to be a long one. Um, I think it's going to be worth it, though. I hope it's going to be worth it. So here what we're going to cover is the problem of suffering in theodicy. Uh, so we're going to begin with kind of an orientation as to that top half of that uh, hourglass we've been looking at. And then kind of a lazy slide here. What the book of Job does teach us and what the book doesn't teach us. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit more later. But I want to start with, remember, week one recap, the iron hourglass, if you will, that intersects at God's omniscience. Uh, we spent the last couple weeks on the bottom one. Uh, if you haven't seen those, go back. Uh, the nature of the human will uh, was one of the video titles. Oh, goodness, what was the other one? Uh, See, so yeah, it was freedom, freedom or bondage to the will, and then uh, is freedom compatible with divine sovereignty, or something close to that. Uh, so now we're looking at this top one, the why evil, why suffering uh, question. So, you know, the idea that if God is all-powerful and God knows all things and God is all-loving and only wants the best for us, then why is there evil and why is there suffering? The reason why I'm doing the book of Job is that when we think about suffering, there are a few places in the Bible that we go to, things like Psalm 22, the story of the crucifixion, and then the book of Job. Psalm 22 is very short. Um, Relatively speaking, it's part of the crucifixion narrative. Uh, Jesus quotes that psalm on the cross. Uh, but also, you know, we don't really feel like we relate to Jesus as much, I don't think, because, you know, Jesus is God and we're humans. We're more like Job. We feel like humans that are suffering, uh, sometimes unjustly. Uh, and then, you know, Job gets an audience with God. And I think this is what we want. Uh, and we really want to hear answers to the questions, uh, in particular, those why questions, something that, uh, you know, people, I've heard it said recently, uh, you know, somebody's like, I, I think, uh, well, I won't call this particular individual out on the podcast, uh, someone who is related to me, um, saying, you know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to go ask God that. And, you know, that's, that's what we want. We want to have an audience with God to get some of our questions answered. And Job gets that audience with God. And so we really kind of, when we hear about that, we want to see what happens. Job asks those why questions. Those are our questions. So I feel like the book of Job resonates with us. So that's why I wanted to dig into it, figure out what can we really get from this book. So we're going to take a whirlwind tour through this book. Uh, the you know material this is based on is probably... Uh, six to eight hours long in video form. Um, I'm going to try and do this in like an hour. We'll see. Uh, but I must say I'm heavily borrowing this uh, from John Walton's treatment of the book of Job. Uh, if you're in the class, his 45-minute, uh, uh, call it sermon lesson on the book of Job was the pre-work for this. Um, his treatment of this as found in the NIV application commentary is the uh, primary, nay, perhaps, you know, sole source for what you're going to see here. So this is heavily indebted to him. Uh, Dr. Walton does a much better job than I will. But if you want a compressed version, uh, then you can find that here. All right. So let's look through the book of Job. So who is Job? Let's start with this. What does the book tell us? So the very first uh, verse, we get an idea of who Job was. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, very many servants, and so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. All right, so what can we get from this? Well, first of all, Job is not an Israelite. Job is from the land of Uz. Uh, he's the greatest of all the people in the East. Uh, East being East of Israel, sort of the, that would be the vantage point. Uh, 
quick note here, the divine name of Yahweh appears often in the book of Job, but Job wasn't an Israelite. You may have noticed that if you see the Lord of all ca- Lord in all caps in there. So bookmark that for now. The other thing we know about this non-Israelite named Job, superlatively well-to-do. Thousands upon thousands of livestock. Uh, you know, this runs up there with some of those numbers, like in the book of Numbers, where like, how many, you know, how much olive oil did they bring? <laughs> Each of the 12 tribes? Uh, so th- this is just a... Uh, Hardly fathomable, uh, fathomably large number of things that Job has. So we're, we have a very well to do non Israelite person. Okay. I really wish my keyboard was. Okay. Here we go. Yep. So where and when did these events occur? So the book is set early. Uh, most scholars would say that this is contemporary with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what they call the patristic period. Uh, that would be if you want to, you know, set your calendars. 1800 to 2000 years BC, uh, around then. And the reasons that we think that, uh, so there's a reference to Kesita, which is unit of currency. Um, we don't see that very often. It's mentioned in Genesis and Joshua. So that would put you somewhere between, you know, 2000 BC and 1500. Uh, references to some other early geography early in the book, the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans. Some other indications, uh, Job is called the family priest. Um, so that was an ancient practice for the patriarch to be the family priest, uh, especially in the absence of some kind of temple. Um, and there's no reference whatsoever in here to covenant law, priesthood, sanctuary temples. Um, you know, one could argue that because Job wasn't an Israelite, that shouldn't be expected. Um, however, there are a whole lot of, as we're going to see, uh, Israelite, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Illusions. That's what I was thinking. Allures. Like, that's not the word. Um, illusions in here. Uh, so one might expect that there would be some references to things like the covenant or the temple. Um, now, none of this, I'm going to say, is um, determinative. We don't actually know when this was written. We don't know who wrote it. We have no idea. Uh, we have no, you know, manuscript dated from 1400 BC that tells us, well, at least it was written by this point. We we don't have any of that. This is sort of the historical speculation that scholars get into. Um, But it appears to be set very early. However, like I said, the book contains many Israelite references. For instance, and the primary one is the usage of the divine name. Uh, The divine name Yahweh is used in the prologue. It's used in the conversations at the end of the book. Um, So this would be post-Sinai authorship or editing, uh, the word Yahweh comes off the lips of Job, which is uh, very curious for a non-Israelite. Bookmark that. Job is also mentioned in Ezekiel. This is included in the Hebrew canon. So if this were pagan literature, you wouldn't really expect it to be in the Hebrew Bible, but there it is. Um, And there's many non-pagan elements of it. So there's no ritual offenses or ritual remedies, so evidence of pagan religion. Uh, This is a very particular point, but uh, when Job in chapter 31 is giving his uh, oath of innocence, where he's saying, here's all the bad things that I could have done that I didn't do, uh, included in there is worship of celestial gods. Uh, That, for somebody in his area, would have been totally a fine thing. Uh, Nobody would have thought of that as a sin. Um, and yet he describes it as such. Um, and then God is expected to be just in this book, uh, unlike in the ancient Near East, where the gods were frankly just expected to be capricious. So there's a good amount of Hebrew Israelite influence in here. And then, like I said before, the people of the East. So this leads us to, okay, hold on a second. So Job is a non-Israelite living in the patristic period, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob period. But the text contains words and facts and concepts that weren't present for hundreds, if not thousands of years after the patristic period. Okay, hold that thought. There's a few more things. I want to go into the text a little bit more. So one day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came up among them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down on it. 
The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job serve God to have heard nothing? Have you not put a fence around him in his house and all the lands he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Stretch out your hand now, touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, all that he has is in your power, only do not stretch your uh, stretch out your hand against him. So Satan went from the presence of the Lord. Okay. What do we make of this? There's actually a lot to make of this here. Uh, I'm going to stop on this three times, I think. But the point I want to make right now is, Job is a non-Israelite who lived in the patristic period. But the text contains words, facts, and concepts that are Israelite, that weren't present for hundreds, if not thousands of years later. And there's a record of a conversation among heavenly beings, which no author is going to be present for. Okay, hold that thought. And the other thing, Job is filled with poetry between chapters 3 and chapter 42. Is basically all poems. Um, people are speaking in poems all the time. I just took a picture of this from my Bible to show you. That's what, when you see this kind of indentation, uh, flowing prose poetry, people don't talk this way. So, but, and yet, like, they've all just become extemporaneous poets. Uh, so, Job is a non Israelite who lives in the patristic period, but is using words that apparently weren't invented for hundreds of years. Um, and there's a record of a conversation among the heavenly beings, which no author could have heard. And people are speaking in poems all the time, which people don't do. What's going on? Hold on a second. Does the book of Job refer to actual events? That's sort of the question that comes up at this point. Like, how could it actually be? Was Job the first person to ever refer to God with the name Yahweh without any sort of revelation? Were they just, was some scribe there just writing down all the words and, oh my gosh, it's like, you know, it's like Shakespeare just popping up out of nowhere. Um, and was the author given a seat at the table during um, the conversation, the courts in heaven? This all seems more characteristic of a story than it does of a historical narrative. And in fact, the consensus among scholars is that the book of Job is wisdom literature. It is not historical narrative. Uh, you're not likely, in all likelihood, you are not looking at something that actually happened in the book of Job. The book of Job, even in the canon, is not included with the history books in the Hebrew Bible. It is included with other wisdom books. You will find it after Second Chronicles, which is sort of the end of the history books, uh, in fact, the Hebrew Bible ends with uh, Second Chronicles. Um, in our canon, you have the you know Genesis through Deuteronomy. The, those are the books of Moses. Then you have the histories: Joshua, and Judges, First, Second Samuel, uh, First, Second Kings, First, Second Chronicles. Uh, Ruth is in there too, um, and then uh, Esther. You have all those in a block. That's the history. Then you get Job. What follows on after Job? Psalms. What follows on after Psalms? Proverbs. Follows on after Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. That's the wisdom literature. Those are very different in genre than the historical books. And so Job is included among them. Uh, wisdom literature, uh, another one in the New Testament, Book of James is uh, wisdom literature. Wisdom literature is valuable for the truth of its message, not its historicity. It's not like the Exodus or the resurrection for which, like, especially in Christianity, the resurrection, everything depends on that being true. If the resurrection is not true, then this whole thing is goofy. Uh, we, we've just got a particularly, um, interesting self-help guru. Uh, you know, even the apostle Paul says, if, you know, the Messiah is not raised, then my preaching is useless and so is your faith. Uh, Wisdom literature is different. It is valued for its message, not its historical content. Now, if you find that a little strange, um, let me proffer this to you, and hopefully this should clear it up. We don't say the message of the tortoise and the hare, Aesop's fable, is false, because there was never a tortoise who raced a hare like that. We don't look at the parable of the prodigal son and say, well, this is obviously false, because it, like, 
there wasn't ever a son that did that who came back to a father and then the brother and had that argument. How would people even know about that? Wait, this isn't historical. That's not the point. Jesus spoke in parables, sort of wisdom stories, stories that encapsulated uh, a point that he was trying to make. We are also familiar with, uh, just to use my example again, Aesop's fables. Um, they are very much in that same vein. Uh, we recognize that when a story is being told to make a particular point, the point is the point of the story, not whether or not the tortoise and the hare actually raced with each other. Um, I'm looking rather ghostly. Let me do something here. Let me see if I can. Okay, I think that looks better. Yes, it's a bit more natural in the lighting. Okay, so Book of Job, guess what? It's wisdom literature. This is a story. This is a story intended to tell um, tell us something about God in much the way that you know you will see um, encapsulated wisdom found in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. The premise of the Book of Job is a referendum, I will say, maybe I'm speaking too strongly, but on what's called the retribution principle. Uh, Let's explain what this means, because I'm going to use that word quite a lot. This is Dr. Walton's word, and I'm just going to straight up borrow it. This is the dominant understanding of how God worked in ancient times. Um, and in some sense, you can find this operative in the Hebrew Bible. Principle goes like this. God prospers the righteous, and God punishes the wicked. So here's some examples from the uh, Old Testament. Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, Blessings and Curses. Uh, first two verses of 28, if you will only obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments that I am commanding you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. So if you obey, blessings. However, if you will not obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments and decrees, which I am commanding you today, there's parallel, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Blessings come from obedience. Curses come from disobedience. Um, you will see this in many Proverbs as well. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the, crav the craving of the wicked. And there's one that I just kind of pulled out there. Um, so this is uh, rather baked into, I would say, the way the Old Testament works. In particular, I'd say the book of Proverbs. If you look at the book of Proverbs, you're going to see a whole lot of retribution in there. So the premise of the book of Job is asking questions about the retribution principle. So we're forming another triangle. I like my triangles. So you have God's justice, you have Job's righteousness, and you have the retribution principle. Now, when Job prospers, everything's fine. Because if Job is righteous, as we saw in that introduction, and God is just, and the righteous prosper and the wicked are punished, uh, then everything's going well. But when Job suffers, something has to give here. Is God unjust? Is Job not really righteous? Is the retribution principle not operative? We have to see. So that, that's how this is being framed. I shouldn't change the slide that quickly. That's how this is being framed. We're going to see this problem set up and then answered by God uh, as we get later into the book. Okay, so let's go back to this part. Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him. The Lord said to Satan, this is a conversation between Yahweh and, as it says here, capital S in the translation that I picked. I think this is the New, Re New Revised Standard. It could be the Holman. Uh, Satan is brought up as a proper name. We need to take a little bit of time and talk about this, though. So, word about Satan. Uh, first of all, does anyone else find it strange that Satan is hanging out in the heavenly court with God? Wasn't Satan supposed to be not there? Uh, don't we believe that Satan is, uh, you know, the devil, the opposer to God? What's he doing just going up there having a conversation with God in the heavenly court? Okay. The word Satan that we see here is from the underlying Hebrew, Hasatan. Uh, so, Satan, Satan, uh, yeah, it's a Hebrew word that we're familiar with. Ha is a definite article. In English, our definite article is the word the. What you're seeing here is actually the Satan. With apologies to our translators, this is not a proper name. Um, 
we don't put the in front of names. Outgoing presidents exempted. Uh, the, the Satan here is identified more as a title than as a name. So Satan in Hebrew means adversary or accuser. It's used 27 times in the Old Testament. You see it in many different places, including one that I'm going to point out here. Numbers 22, Balaam and his donkey. God's anger was kindled because Balaam was going, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the road as his adversary, his Hasatan. Now he was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. Here's what I want to point out. The angel of the Lord is called Satan here. It's not a proper name, folks. This is a role that's being played. This is the adversary. This is an accuser. Uh, that's the term that I'm going to go with. I think Dr. Walton uses challenger. Uh, but what's not happening here is the devil that we see tempting Jesus in the heavenly court. Uh, this is someone who is playing a role in God's counsel as a challenger, the adversary, the accuser. Um, paper I wrote in uh, graduate school, I called him a divine prosecutor. Uh, this is a heavenly role. Uh, and so we are not seeing the, um, you know, Diablo kind of character here. We are seeing the accuser rather than capital S, Satan, Lucifer, devil, you know, whomever you see. I try to refrain from using Lucifer, but um, perhaps that's another uh, another video. Uh, the one that you see in the book of Revelation. It's not who we're dealing with here. It's a different character. Okay, so in this dialogue, the Lord says to the accuser, uh, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. And then the accuser answers the Lord, and I bolded here, does Job serve God for nothing? Have you not put a fence around him, blessed the work of his hands, his possessions have increased? Uh, if only you will stretch out your hand, he's going to curse you to your face. This phrase here, does Job serve God for nothing? I think this is where you're going to see um, the theme or one of the major themes of the book revolving around. So does Job serve God for nothing? Now, this is often understood as a challenge against Job. Is Job really that righteous? Uh, or is it just because he gets something for it? Uh, and that's kind of how it sounds. If you take away his stuff, then he's going to curse you to your face. So the question is, is Job really righteous? Is the way we often read this. I don't think that's the right way to read it, though. Because, first of all, in the very first verse, um, what do they say that Job is? Job is an upright and blameless person. Uh, and in fact, even God here, um, you know, there is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. There you go. That's uh, Job is not unrighteous in any way. Uh, so Job is exonerated from the charge. Nowhere in the book is that challenged uh, or is uh, there any indication that Job's righteousness is actually in question? Part of the reason Job's friends are so frustrating is that they assume the retributive principle. Job is suffering, therefore he must have done something wrong, even though both we and Job know that that's not the case from the very beginning. So the challenge isn't about Job's righteousness. The book never calls Job's, right Job's righteousness into question. It appears that the idea that the righteous should prosper and the wicked should suffer, that's the principle that's being brought up. That's the principle that's being challenged. Because then righteousness is fake. That's sort of what the accuser is getting at here. Um, this is not a challenge against Job's righteousness. Uh, I really don't think it is. So here's how this all works out. The accuser is basically saying, God shouldn't bless the righteous because you just get fake virtue. What we're going to see later is that Job is going to say, God shouldn't punish the righteous because then God is not just. And then in Walton's words, what's a God to do? This is sort of where we're starting to get. And in fact, I think the, uh, the book breaks down according to these two questions. You get the accuser's challenge takes you through chapter 27. Uh, the question of uh, can one be righteous absent the rewards that come from it.
uh, what Walton would call disinterested righteousness. Uh, so it's the question of, should God bless the righteous? Um, or is that just a way to get fake virtue? Is it possible to uh, be virtuous without that? And then the second part of the book, uh, from I think like chapter 29 all the way up through 42, is about Job's question here. Uh, is it just for God to punish the righteous? So I think that's what organizes the book. Uh, so in here, yeah, I, I do want to say like the backdrop of this is the problem of suffering, the inherent in inequalities of life. I think that's um, playing into these two questions. Uh, why, from a wisdom perspective, do we care about this? We see uh, righteous people who suffer. We see wicked people who prosper. What's going on with God's policies here? Uh, so what does God do? God deputizes the accuser to act on his behalf and to come against Job. Note, and this is an important note, and this is the last thing I'm going to say about Satan, I think, I hope. God takes full responsibility for this. The accuser is a minor character. He's going to fade away after this chapter. Actually, he'll sh uh, that's a little false. He'll show up in chapter 2. He's going to fade away after chapter 2. You're never going to hear from him again. The accuser is limited. The accuser cannot lay a hand on Job. He must spare Job's life in chapter 2. And God was incited against Job by the accuser that's in chapter uh, 2 as well. At no point does God say, the devil made me do it. Uh, God takes full responsibility for everything that's uh, happening in all of this. There's not a lesson to be learned in the book of Job about spiritual warfare or about the role of Satan. Uh, Satan can only do... The accuser here can only do what God is deputizing him to do for the purpose of this wisdom story. Uh, but it's really just to set up the trial. So the, please don't overread this. There's not a theology of Satan that you can get out of the book of Job. So let me go back to this question, is God testing Job real quick? Um, this is going to refer back to one of our uh, one of our four models of foreknowledge, actually. So if God is testing Job, it's reasonable to ask, well, if God has exhaustive definite foreknowledge of whether or not Job will pass, isn't this unnecessary cruelty? What's about to happen? It's a fine question. Why does this have to be dramatized out like this if God infallibly knows or even is decreeing whether or not Job will pass the test? Um, some open theists actually read this as an argument in favor of open theism. It goes like this. Premise one, God is just. Premise two, God would be unjust if he tested Job through suffering while knowing the outcome of the test. Premise three, God tested Job through suffering. Conclusion, therefore God must not have known the outcome. Conclusion two, therefore God does not have exhaustive definite foreknowledge. So it's interesting, if you take the um, view that Job is actually being tested, you do have this kind of moral quandary. Uh, you've, there's this meta question of God's justice. Was it even just for God to put Job to the test like that? However, if, as I contend, that this is not a test of Job's righteousness, which in fact the book does not contest, but rather of God's wisdom and God's policies, then the point isn't to see whether or not Job passes. Um, you know, Dr. Walton says that you know, the uh, Job's friends think Job is the defendant in a criminal case. Job thinks that Job is the plaintiff in a civil case. What's actually taking place is Job is the star witness for the defense of God's policies. Um, it's kind of an interesting formulation there. So rather, God's policies do have to be played out in order to vindicate them. Um, and furthermore, if this is to be understood, as I contend, as parabolic, not literal, then concluding open theism from this story is improper. It's not the message of the book. This isn't something that actually happened. This is a wisdom story. And the point isn't to tell us about God's foreknowledge. The point is to tell us about God's policies in relation to the righteous and the wicked and suffering or lack thereof. So just like I said, there's no theology of spiritual warfare to be um, gained from here or theology of Satan. There's also not an argument for open theism coming from this because of the nature of the genre in both cases. Okay, so what's the result of the accuser's actions? Job loses his children and his estate. 
all of it, gone. Uh, yet Job maintains his integrity. Yahweh gave, Yahweh has taken away. Blessed be the name of Yahweh. There we go again with the non-Israelite using the word Yahweh. This is why we think that even though the this was set early, it was written later by Israelites to Israelites. Uh, so then Job is struck with physical illness. This is after, so the, the accuser goes back, uh, talks to God again. God's like, have you considered my servant Job? Uh, he's blameless and upright. Um, even after that test and the accuser's like, oh yeah, well, you just took his stuff away. What if you afflict his body? And then God says, very well, just don't kill him. So then Job is struck with physical illness. Job doubles down in conversation with his wife. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? So Job is maintaining his faith and righteousness through this. So then Job is joined by his wife, friends, uh, wife and friends, Elphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. These are literary functionaries. I mean, you gotta know this at this point. When Job's wife's only line in the whole book is curse God and die. It's not weeping and grieving along with Job for the loss of their children and everything, really. No, these are people who are uh, avatars of a philosophy, not the actual events being reported. So these characters come in to show us uh, a dialogue on different ways of thinking that um, are related to suffering. The friends represent the voice of the retributive principle. So here's how this happens to Job's wife and friends. First, Job's wife comes in first. And basically uh, gives the idea, and you've heard this before, suffering makes life not worth living. You know, curse God and die. Job's response, no, life consists of both suffering and not suffering. Okay, good on Job. Did a pretty good job there. Eliphaz comes in. You know from experience that God punishes the wicked. You are being punished, therefore you are wicked. I'm abbreviating a whole lot here in these dialogues. Uh, but that's the essence of Eliphaz. Job's response, but I didn't do anything wrong. Bildad comes in. How dare you suggest that God is unjust? Because that's the implication of what's, what Job is saying. Uh, you are being punished, therefore you're wicked. I didn't do anything wrong. Therefore, you know, by implication, my punishment is unjust. Bildad's like, no, 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 no. How dare, how dare you? God is not unjust. And then basically chorusing with Elphaz. God is not unjust. You are being punished, therefore you did something wrong. Job. Okay, so now Job is drifting a little bit. Job is like, I'll say it. God is unjust. He actually does do that uh, because I did nothing wrong. Zophar comes in. What arrogance. Repent. And this is interesting. And you can get your stuff back. The stuff that was taken away from Job. Zophar, and to an extent, Elidad, I'm sorry, Eliphaz and Bildad too, uh, are offering Job the opportunity to be restored in God's grace by confessing whatever sin that he's just refusing to confess and doubling down that he's actually uh, totally righteous. They're like, no, no, no. You have to turn yourself around because the only reason this could possibly be happening to you is if you did something really bad. And the fact that you're not even going to say it means you're an even worse doo-doo. Job's response, if I could bring my case to God, I'd win. I hope I get the chance. So Job is just completely committed to Job's righteousness here. Uh, so we see this play out. All you have to do to get your stuff back is admit you have sinned. So Zophar has a really good you know, line here in chapter 11. If you direct your heart rightly, you will stretch out your hands toward him. If iniquity is in your hand, put it far away. and Do not let wickedness reside in your tents. Surely then you will lift up your face without blemish. You will be secure and you will not fear. You will forget your misery. You will remember it as waters that have passed away. Your life will be brighter than the noonday. Its darkness will be like morning. You will have confidence because there is hope. You will be protected and take your rest in safety. You will lie down and no one will make you afraid. Many will entreat you for favor. But the eyes of the wicked will fail. All way of escape will be lost to them. And their hope is to breathe their last. So this is basically, if you direct your heart lightly, lightly, if you will direct your heart rightly, uh, you will lift up your face without blemish, and you will be secure, and you won't fear. All you got to do is just 
admit the thing that you've done wrong. So here's where the difference lies on this triangle that we looked at earlier. So Job maintains Job's righteousness and believes in the retribution principle and therefore questions God's justice. Okay, that's not so good for Job. As we're going to see by the end, Job is not intended to be a role model. The friends maintain God's justice and the retribution principle. And so they can't make sense of Job's righteousness. That's not a thing. Job can't be righteous if that's what's going on. So here's what's going on. And I didn't bring this back later. When we get to Elihu, Elihu tries to, <laughs> in our, uh, if you don't know what I mean by this, you'll have to go back and look at the Molinism video. He tries to be the Molinist to redefine the terms to actually make the triangle work. Uh, but so this is how this is playing out. And essentially those uh, dialogues from chapter three up through chapter 27 is just this going around in a circle. Uh, both of them are assuming the retribution principle, and that's partially why they're stuck. Okay, so Job's friends continue to double down. Your insistence on getting your righteousness on, I'm sorry, your insistence on your righteousness is condemning you. Repent now so you can get your stuff back. That's what they're saying. If you repent, you will get your stuff back. Uh, if Job capitulates and assumes that they are telling the truth by confessing that he did something wrong in order to follow their advice and be restored to God's grace, the accuser wins. Job's righteousness is indeed because of the, tributive, the retributive principle. Job does uh, not serve God for nothing because and he's like, imagine this. If Job decides that he's going to say, God, I'm sorry for whatever it is that I've done. I have wronged you. I have offended you. Um, clearly, that's what's going on here. Uh, otherwise, I would not be suffering. Please restore me. Um, then it's all about the stuff. So the accuser wins. If I hope you see this. The accuser wins if Job gives in. Job holds on to his righteousness, even in the face of immense pressure to say otherwise. Um, so verse 20, I'm sorry, chapter 27, as long as my breath is in me, the spirit of God is in my nostrils. My lips will not speak falsehood. My tongue will not utter deceit. Far be it from me to say that you are right. Until I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness. I will not let it go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. So we're going to get to this. Job is, um, if you're thinking, well, wow, Job is a really self-righteous guy. Job is a really self-righteous guy. Um, What's the point, though? Well, Job is not a role model. Uh, but at the same time, the question is, does Job serve God for nothing? And that could be rephrased as, is Job's righteousness contingent upon the stuff? And so far, like Job is not given in, and he won't. So Job's righteousness wasn't contingent upon reward. He maintained it even when he was told he would be restored, uh, if he gave it up or if he admitted that the, uh, the only reason he's suffering is because he must not be righteous. Um, and so because of that, God's vindicated through this. The accuser loses. So some midpoint conclusions before we get to the back half of the book. Remember, this is wisdom literature. We're looking for the message that is being sent. We should be very careful not to learn lessons from this book that we're not supposed to learn, and we'll go over some of those at the end. So I posit a summary that goes something like this. Suffering can befall you for reasons you do not understand. Perhaps no reason at all, or at least as far as you will ever know, no reason at all. Amidst your suffering, you may be tempted to lie or declare existence pointless. Do not go there. The... Nothing good will come of lying in the face of suffering. It will only make it worse. So you, you can't, you can't do that. Righteousness also should not be contingent upon blessing or reward. And this is going to be through the, uh, a theme through the whole book. And I'll foreshadow it here. Uh, the question, does Job serve God for nothing? That question is going to be posed to us as readers. Do you serve God for nothing? And I think there's something for us to think about as Christians on this. When we talk about our heavenly reward, what are we acting for? Why do we believe that we should be righteous? The book of Job is going to challenge anybody who 
wishes to serve for the reward. Okay, so part two. This is going to take you from about chapter, I think it's 29, up through the end of the book, basically, up to the epilogue in the middle of chapter 42. So part one was about the question, if God prospers the righteous, will there be enduring disinterested righteousness, or is it just about the reward? And we are told, you know, in the message of the book, that it shouldn't just be about the reward. Job asserts that his righteousness is real, regardless of whether he has blessings or not, and he won't say what he believes to be untrue in order to get it back. Part two is now Job's question. Why should God let the righteous suffer? So why should the righteous prosper? That's the accuser's question, because then that's going to be fake. And Job now, why should the righteous suffer? Because that's not just. So the issue here is that Job thinks that his righteousness is more important than God's reputation. Like I said, Job, Job's not a terrible character. Uh, there is some good, but he's not a role model. Job is a bone to pick with God. Job does not show interest in regaining his prosperity, but he does care about restoring his reputation. He does care about vindication. He really wants to be right. And after all, uh, this would sort of allow him back in the community. So Job's self-righteousness is now going to become an issue. So in chapter 31, Job has this oath of innocence. So Job swears his innocence, gives an exhaustive litany of sins that he has not done. And then right near the very end, he says, here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. This is uh, chapter 31, verse 35. So what's the purpose of this oath? This is the whole, like, I made a covenant with my eyes. I will not look on a woman. I will not try and gain power. I will not try and do this. I will not do that. Um, or that I wouldn't do this. And I never did that. And I won't worship celestial beings, et cetera, et cetera. I keep saying won't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. So he's going over all the things he didn't do. And then, you know, does, does his whole Martin Luther, here I stand. I can do no other. Like, here's my signature. Let God answer me. So why is he saying that? Well, God has been absent during Job's constant declaration of his own righteousness. And Job is livid about this. Job has wanted God to enter into Job's courtroom, Job in the judge's seat, God in the defendant's chair, and answer, why am I suffering right now? Because I am righteous. You owe me that answer, God. That's been Job's perspective. And the friends are like, get out of the judge's chair you get in the defendant chair and you confess. So by swearing an oath, Job is trying to turn the tables on God. It's sort of a clever thing he's doing. Job intends to force God's hand by swearing an oath of his own righteousness. According to the way, the, uh, according to the way Job thinks the world works, retribution, God would be obligated to punish him if he's lying. So this is a way for him to try to force a response from God. If God's going to stay silent, amidst this oath of innocence, then Job is vindicated. He can claim his righteousness has been affirmed. He can go back and rebuild his life. And everybody's got to shut up about the bad things that he did because I took an oath of innocence and look at me, I'm still here. And it didn't get any worse. So that's what Job's trying to do. He's trying to force a conversation with God. And just as we're, just as we think that's what's going to happen, Ellie who comes in is a brand new character. Hey, guys, I've been off to the side listening, and I didn't say anything for a while, but now I want to jump in. It's interesting, and we don't have time to get into this right now, but unlike the other friends, Elihu has a Hebrew name. Um, so, But like I said, we don't have time to get into that. I should probably have not even kept it on the slide. Elihu agrees with the accuser about Job's motives. Elihu thinks that Job actually, deep down, really is still doing it for this stuff, you know, do you think this to be just? You say, I am in the right before God. If you ask, what advantage have I? How am I better off than if I had sinned? Um, so that question, if you ask, what advantage have I? How am I better off than if I had sinned? Ha, I caught you, Job. That's you actually caring about your stuff. Uh, you really do want that back. All this righteousness is, in fact, pretended. Um, so the thing that Job is secretly still wanting those benefits. Elihu says that the problem here is Job's self-righteousness. That's the thing that's worthy of punishment by God. Specifically, Job's willingness to impugn the character of God in defense of his own righteousness is the reason that he's being punished. So that's an interesting take. So Job is now getting a reproach on his own self-righteous character. Elihu spends just as much of his time defending the character of God um, 
actually more of his time defending the character of God than uh, anything else. All right. Hi, everybody. Whoa, it changed in here. <laughs> Sun has gone down. Uh, I've had some dinner and we're time, uh, we're time. It's time to uh, finish this up. So before Job has a chance to respond to Elihu, who comes in, but Yahweh. So we see God himself coming in and God shows up in a whirlwind. Um, you know, God could have showed up in a gentle breeze. God could have showed up, I suppose, in a burning bush. Uh, we've seen that before. God could have shown up in many different ways. God shows up in a storm. So we get this sense of God's disposition right now in the way that he's showing up. He's showing up in the whirlwind, and he's speaking sarcastically to Job, right? You know, we have this line, uh, it's probably, I would say it's among the most remembered lines from the book of Job. You know, there's maybe like three I can think of. Um you know, there's, I know that my Redeemer lives. Thank you, Handel. Uh, we have, uh, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him or I will hope in him. Um, a lot of translation um, issues on that, actually. Um, there's, you know, Job's wife, curse God and die. Uh, but this one here, I think, is the one that we remember the most. And it's God coming in and saying right away, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Uh, speak if you have understanding. Or going on, you know, as he keeps going this a little bit later, but surely you know the number of your days is great. Uh, so God's not particularly happy right now. God has not come in on Job's terms. God has come in on God's terms. God is here to not really explain himself to Job. Now, that's what Job's been wanting. Job has been waiting for God to enter into Job's scenario here where he is in the judge's seat, God is in the defendant's chair or in the witness stand, and Job gets to cross-examine God. And instead, God shows up and does the opposite. God is also starting to disabuse the notion of the retribution principle, and this is going to be fully repudiated later. But notice some of the things that he says. I know we're, we're blasting over this right now. But, um, yeah, God says, Who has cut a channel for the torrents of rain? to bring rain on the land where no one lives, on the desert, which is empty of human life, and to make the ground put forth grass. Okay, why is it, why does this matter? You know, rain could be blessing or curse, right? Lack of rain could be blessing or curse. Uh, in the retributive mindset, you know, God's actions are uh, in response to something that humans are doing. And what God is saying is, Job, there's so much that I am doing that is outside of your framework of God's actions on retribution. So there are plenty of reasons that rain falls that have nothing to do with blessing or curse. And he goes on and on. What about the lightning? What about pray for the lion? You know, this goes on for a very long time. Now, Job, after this first, uh, you know, chapter 38 and 39, uh, where Yahweh gives his first speech, Job acknowledges his inability to answer God. I've spoken once, I will not answer twice, but we'll proceed no further. So Job is saying, all right, never mind. Uh, you're right, God. To be honest, I think many people kind of end the book here. God pulls rank, says, you have no right to question me, uh, or you have no right to ask the question. You can't question God. And that's where Job ends. But there's more to this book. It's not done yet. God turns that around. God says, Job, you go to your rightful place, which is out there. I will be in the judge's seat. And now you are going to be the defendant. Now it's my turn. I will question you and you will declare to me. Then we get this really kind of strange situation. What does God talk about? God talks about these chaos monsters that we see on the side. Behemoth, uh, from which we sometimes get the word behemoth, and Leviathan. Uh, if you remember a little bit from like Psalm 104, Leviathan is kind of a plaything for God in the waters of chaos. So, you know, if you, uh, there's a three tiered universe in the, uh, ancient Near East. So you have the waters below, the earth, uh, is the flat disc and the heavens above. And in the waters, you know, they imagined that the world was a disc and, you know, they could see the sea and the sea was just this tumbling, 
nether region that went out as far as the eye could see. Um, it was chaos. Frankly, you know, it kind of is. Uh, it's non-ordered space. Uh, and in there lived Leviathan, the monster of chaos, the devourer, you know, as you can see in the picture, spits fire. Um, so these chaos monsters come up and God talks about behemoth and Leviathan. Uh, they're used as literary devices. God compares Job to Behemoth. So look at Behemoth, which I, uh, which I made just as I made you. And there's comparisons to Job. Uh, he is content and well fed, like Job used to be. Remember, Job was, you know, fabulously, you know, uh, wealthy. Uh, he was first among his kind, as was a human, like Job. Um, he was sheltered, like Job was. Um, but God points out something about Behemoth that is not true of Job. The Behemoth is not frightened, even if the river is turbulent. Implication, Job should be more like this. So Job is like this one chaos monster, except in the way that, you know, would be appropriate right now. Um, that Job should not be frightened even when the river is turbulent. Leviathan, on the other hand, is untamable. And God starts to almost do a little bit of comparison between himself and Leviathan, but then one ups him. So can Leviathan be domesticated? Will it make a covenant with you and serve you? The Leviathan is invincible. It can't be caught. It can't be uh, damaged. It can't be you know anything. This uh, The latter half of uh, chapter 41 goes into all that. Then God claims, a fortiori, that's uh, lesser to the greater, how much more? So if this is true, then how much more is that true? No one is ferocious enough to rouse Leviathan. Then who can stand against me? Um, interesting that that's a comparison. That God is saying, um, if you can't handle Leviathan, if you can't dominate Leviathan, if you can like, you can't even touch it, how much more am I greater than that? You can't touch me, Job. Uh, this is an interesting way for God to speak, right? Uh, again, think about this is a literary uh, construct. This is a wisdom parable. Job then answers the Lord, I know that you can do all things, that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you will declare me. I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is Job's response. So Job isn't going, okay, never mind. Job is like, I was in the wrong. I have spoken things too wonderful for me to know, too mysterious for me to know. And I despise myself and I repent. Job actually admits at this point, wrongdoing. Job has decided that in this way, I was not fully righteous. So let's look at some of the things in God's response. Let's break this down. God does not defend his justice. That didn't happen. God does not explain Job's suffering. That didn't happen either. God doesn't answer Job's oath. That's, you know, Job wanted an audience with God to get a verdict on the oath of innocence that he took. But God didn't do that. God also rejects the retributive principle, both within that, but also much more explicitly a little bit after. Uh, Yahweh says to Eliphaz, uh, I am angry with you and your two friends, as you have not spoken the truth about me, as my servant Job has, and tells them to go sacrifice, and then Job will pray for them. So, interesting. The friends were not speaking truth. Now, what were the friends focused in on? They were focused in on the retributive principle. They were focused in on the righteous will prosper and the wicked will perish or be punished. And God is saying to all three of them, you have not spoken the truth about me. So God is saying, this is not the way the world works. Without a defense of his justice or an explanation, he's saying, no, drop the retribution principle. That is not a governing idea for all things. It's not that mechanical. That's not how life is always going to be ordered. God has seemingly only given us one thing we can do, which is trust him. God doesn't provide the reasons for the suffering. And, you know, the book of Job doesn't state that there are reasons for suffering. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't. Uh, it's left open as a possibility. But just because we can't fathom what God can, uh, 
doesn't mean that there are no reasons, but the book doesn't guarantee that there are reasons. We're not really... The, the reason, the backward looking, is not the point. And I think that's some of the force of what's being communicated in this wisdom parable. When you're suffering, looking backward isn't going to get you anywhere. Don't even bother with it. What matters is what's going to happen going forward. So when we cannot understand where there may be no reasons that we can ascertain, the only thing we can do is trust in God's wisdom. And I think that's part of the um, part of the message of the book of Job. Now, when we get to the conclusion of the book, God gives Job a large estate and children back. And I'm just going to say this is profoundly unsatisfying. I think people have seen this for a long time. Ten more children doesn't bring back the previous ten. These are they were people. These new ten. It's like you can't just go get in a brand new child. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and also, is God now doing the retribution thing that he just said he wasn't doing? Uh, many people have looked at this and been very uh, understandably, I think, uh, disturbed or uh, unsettled by the way the book of Job ends. Now, recall that this is a wisdom story. This is not narrative. Um, so this is literary exploration. I think it would be... F- Frankly, be far worse if what did happen was the ten children died, and then later, you know, as if it made up for it, ten, uh, Job had ten more children. But this is what are we learning in the parable? What is the story telling us? I think that's what we have to hone in on. God's policies were being challenged, and the conclusion is that God will continue to act as God did before. God's policies unchanged. So Job, and here's what I think is important. Job can no longer see his prosperity as a reward, but rather as a gift. I think that's something that's happening here, because before all of this took place, Job was in the retribution mindset. If I am righteous, I will prosper. If I'm wicked, then I will perish. Uh, Job, having gone through this whole ordeal, now getting the, this restoration, Job knows this isn't a reward. Job had stuff at the beginning, and Job was righteous. Job was suffering terribly, and Job was righteous. Now Job has things again, and Job is righteous. One of the things that was common through that is Job's righteousness, and yet his lot was variable. So you can see now demonstrated through this, this is a gift from God. This is not necessarily a reward. It is not a mechanical. This is not transactional. That's not how... This all works. So, oh yes, that's what I just said. So God does not tie our prosperity or lack thereof to our moral standing. And now Job knows it. Uh, Job knows it. Job knows it. So what can we discern about suffering then from the book of Job? So is suffering divine punishment? The book of Job rejects that proposition. That's the retribution principle. I wouldn't say that it's uh, exempted. You know, you can see plenty of examples in the Old Testament in particular where suffering was divine punishment, but it's not always that. It, the world is more complicated than that. Um, is suffering a divine test or a trial of faith? The book of Job would reject that proposition too, um, at least as a category. Um, it is not mechanical like that. It doesn't just go from, uh, from one to the other. The book explores God's wisdom. It's not a test of Job. Suffering a consequence of human freedom. We, you know, this is something that we've talked about before. At best, it's an incomplete explanation because Job does not suffer at the hand of humans. And there's many people who experience what's called natural evil or uh, natural events that, uh, you know, say a tsunami or an earthquake, completely unprompted. Um, and that suffering has nothing to do with human freedom. Is suffering the result of sin? I mean, some of it can be and is. We see that elsewhere in the Bible, but the book of Job teaches us it's not always the case. Life is more complicated than that. Sometimes the righteous suffer. And maybe that's one of the important points. Sometimes the righteous suffer. We should not presuppose that God is always working um, in the way where suffering is the result of sin. How about is suffering inevitable? Well, it appears so. I mean, we experience pain. We all die. We become emotionally vulnerable in relationships, and as such, we will likely suffer to some extent. 
Um, Jesus asks us to take up our cross and follow him. It is a manner of suffering. You know, we, we remember that verse, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Maybe saying it sort of as quickly and dismissively as I just did when like taking up one's cross, that was the means of Roman execution. That was, it was a death march. This is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, when Christ bid you come, he bid you come and die. Uh, suffering is axiomatic. It's, uh, almost a feature of consciousness. Uh, could you have consciousness without suffering? Um, uh, I'm not sure you could. Uh, it appears to be part of the program of being human. Um, uh, so how should we face it? Well, you know, we see in the book of James, Christians should consider it all joy when we uh, face all sorts of trials, knowing that perseverance leads to endurance, which leads to maturity, and we are uh, complete lacking in nothing. Um, we are told to look forward through that suffering, to um, to build ourselves in Christian character, to conform ourselves to the image of our suffering Messiah, in that through suffering we can become more than what we were before. Now, people aren't universally going to make it through their suffering. We see that. That's true. Our prayer is that God strengthen us so that we can carry on. Um, we're not guaranteed to get through it. Um, as we said, well, we all die. But you have a choice. You can choose to face your suffering courageously, or you can face it resentfully. Um, and I don't see any world in which facing it resentfully is preferable to facing it courageously. And finally, we should trust in God's wisdom. We do not know. The one thing we know is that the mechanical formula of righteous prosper and the wicked are punished isn't how the world works. And we weren't given an explanation. We are told we can't understand it. The only thing we have left then is trust. And that's what we must do. You know, when I was thinking about this, uh, uh, I was thinking about the message of the book and what it is and what it isn't. And there were a few things that popped into my mind about what it isn't. Uh, first, it's not that we should be like Job. Uh, Job is not really a role model. Job is very self-righteous. Uh, there's some good things in Job, but Job also impugns the character of God quite frequently. Uh, so we should be very careful in saying that we should strive to be like Job. Uh, <laughs> that Satan is the source of our problems. For heaven's sake, don't take that away from the book of Job. It has nothing to do with that. The accuser, it's not even the devil. The accuser is a uh, minor character in the opening uh, who is just there to set the scene. Um, so that that is not a message of the book of Job. It is not true that if you endure in faith, suffering will eventually go away. That's not guaranteed to us through the book. And just because Job had stuff restored to him at the end doesn't mean that uh, that's what's going to happen. Now, I'd say in this life, you know, as Christians, we believe that if we have put our faith in the Messiah, then there is a new creation that awaits us uh, if we endure in faith and persevere to the end. Uh, but I don't think in this life we should expect that. How about that the retributive principle is, after all, how the world operates? We've been over that. That is, you know, even though Job got his stuff back at the end, that's not the point. Um, <laughs> how about God will speak to you if you're stubborn enough? Uh, no guarantee of that. Uh, just because God eventually showed up in Job's case doesn't mean that you can expect that in your case. Um, and finally, it's not a defense of God's justice. We've not come across that. There is not... Uh, the only theory of God's justice that was advanced was the retributive principle, and that was rejected. The book of Job doesn't contain a theory of God's justice that is supposed to span the rest of the Bible. It is instead a question of trust. So the message of the book is, I think, is that, first of all, the book of Job wants to help us avoid poor responses about God in the midst of suffering. We shouldn't be saying we're getting what we deserve, or perhaps they're getting what they deserve. Uh, we should not be saying that God is just, uh, God is unjust. And we should not be saying that prosperity is just a confession of sin away. And if all we would do is just, you know, say the thing that, um, you know, 
name the thing that's going wrong, that things would eventually get better. Um, I don't think those are what's, um, what's it coming out of the book. This one is one of the most important ones. Do not look backward and ask why questions. There is nothing to find there. And I think, you know, the, this is my, my, uh, sort of addition to this right now. Um, the why questions weren't answered. And I think, you know, the part of the point of this wisdom parable is that you're, you're not necessarily going to find a why. The only thing you're going to find is bitterness and resentment. That's what ended up happening with Job. Job was bitter and Job was resentful when he was stuck in the why questions. And when he got over it and trust in God, things got better. And I don't know, like, we shouldn't pretend that there are answers to our why questions. And so getting stuck in the past as, you know, why did this happen only just creates this toxic emotional stew uh, as opposed to courageously facing our suffering and asking what can we do about it. Reasons, if they exist, as God was saying, are likely beyond our ability to find. What I thought of here, um, psychologist Jordan Peterson, um, I was listening to a lecture of his and he said this phrase and jotted it down and got it in the slideshow. Uh, he just said, life is suffering. What do you do about that? You voluntarily accept it and then strive to overcome the suffering. And like, notice what's not said in there. You look back at why and you get yourself an answer. That the only thing that you can do is bear it. Like the cross, you are to bear your suffering and go forth humbly, but courageously to try and make something better of it. Um, it is an axiom of existence. It wasn't, you know, at some point it will come and find you. Um, I think that's coming out of Job too. Another part of the message of the book, uh, I foreshadowed this earlier, but does Job serve God for nothing? Uh, we should be willing to serve God for nothing. We should not expect reward in this life for serving God. We are, you know, Jesus basically tells us to expect the opposite, uh, to expect to be uh, persecuted or to expect to be uh, living some sort of life of suffering or separation from the uh, things that all those around us would think are indications of success. Uh, we're supposed to be kind of weird and we're supposed to maybe even put ourselves in danger to help other people. Uh, we should be willing to serve God for no reward. And, you know, I will say if I hit the end of my life and I have, you know, hopefully served God, um, even if there's nothing there, I won't regret it. I do believe there's something there, but I think we should be willing to have that attitude that we should be willing to serve God, even if we get nothing in this life. Um, just based on a, a hope that we have that there will be a restoration later. That should be sufficient. Uh, this is one of the main themes of the book. Does Job serve God for nothing? The implication we should be willing to do so because we may get nothing. So we shouldn't be in the business of righteousness just for a heavenly reward. That is not true conformity to the character of our Messiah. Um, Oh, right. Yes. This note here. Think about the sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis 22. Uh, it's, I mean, something I could hardly uh, think of myself having to do, but Isaac was the son of the covenant, the thing that Abraham was promised. And he waited almost a hundred years, finally got Isaac and then was told to sacrifice him. That was, you know, right there. Do you trust God or do you just show faith when you get something out of it, which is the son? That was the real test for Abraham. Abraham served God for nothing. Um, and Abraham was indeed one of the exemplars of faith. And then finally, we we're to trust God amidst suffering. Uh, we cannot put ourselves in the judge's seat and put God in the defendant's seat. That's not, uh, that's not how the world works. And it's not going to go well. You're going to get a whirlwind of sarcasm at you, so to speak. Do not call on God to defend himself. That was one of Job's mistakes. God's wisdom is beyond our capacity to fathom. And that is what we are to ultimately rest in. 
when there are no answers. And when we look backward, we may not find them. But rather than being bitter and resentful, we should look forth courageously. We should take up our cross and we should be willing to serve God, even if we don't get anything for it. Trust comes in where our reason and understanding fail. And we are ultimately taught, uh, taught to trust. So there you go. I believe that's the message of the book of Job. And uh, I hope that this was an enlightening and somewhat different take than you may have been uh, familiar with before. But I think if we get the book of Job right, we can start to apply its lessons to other things that we see in life. And so that's what we're going to try and do next week. We take up the case of the coronavirus in particular, that suffering that has befallen the world and say, what should our response to that be? So I hope you'll join for that. And as always, God bless.